Members and guests, please welcome Sean Murphy. That is really good walk-up music, i got to admit. Um, good evening. How's the member summit going for y'all? Good times. Good, good. And I'm glad, I'm glad you stuck around. Um, and I think you're going to be really glad that you stuck around here um, in a minute as I uh, introduce you to Herb Weisbaum. Uh, I want to make a welcome to our pre uh, presentation on how to protect yourself from identity theft. My name is Sean Murphy and I'm the BECU Chief Information Security Officer. I'm delighted to introduce our guest speaker and this topic, which is near and dear to all of our hearts. We are live streaming this session on our website, so welcome to everyone who's watching online. Tonight's speaker is Herb Weisbaum, who many of you know as the Consumer Man. He's an Emmy award-winning broadcaster and one of America's top consumer experts. You hear Herb's consumer reports Monday through Friday on Como News Radio. He also covers the consumer beat nationally for NBCNews.com. Herb has been looking out for consumers in Western Washington since 1981. His investigative reports led to the passage of the Washington State's Lemon Law. At BECU, protecting our members' sensitive data is one of the most important responsibilities we have. So we're thrilled that Herb is joining us tonight to share his tips and tricks on how we can protect ourselves from identity theft. Please join me in welcoming Herb Weisbaum, the consumer man, to the stage. Thank you, sir. How you doing? Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. It is a thrill for me to be here as well. Uh, BECU is the sponsor of my Friday financial tip on Como News Radio, and uh, it's uh, been, been doing that for years and years and years, and I'm thrilled to have them as a sponsor. It's, a, it's an organization that actually walks the talk. They actually try to do good things all the time, so that's just a thrill uh, to uh, be associated with them. And for all of those watching on the WWW, the World Wide Web, it is nice uh, for you to be along with us as well. When we talk about identity theft, the reaction from people is usually one of two things. Either they totally freak out or they completely turn off. And I'm here to tell you that neither of those are the right response. There's no need to freak out. You do need to be cautious. You need to be responsible. You need to look out for yourself, but you don't need to freak out. And certainly don't turn off. That is what's called data breach fatigue. People are so used to the data breaches that take place all the time, they just throw their hands up in the air and say, there's absolutely nothing I can do, so whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And I'm here to tell you that's not the way to be either because there are things you can do, a lot of things you can do to protect yourself and make the life, the life harder for the identity thief who's trying to steal your information. So let's go through some of these things right now about identity theft. First of all, the numbers. So identity fraud, there were 14.4 million victims in 2018, and the bad guys got about $15 billion from these victims. Most of these numbers are underreported. Um, because most people don't report it or there are not a lot of reporting systems for identity fraud, but that's the number we have to work with. Data breaches in 2018, astronomical, 447 million consumer records, almost a half a billion consumer records were stolen in 2018. That is up 126% from 2017. So it is a staggering problem that continues to grow year in and year out. 1.6 billion non-sensitive records were stolen. So you always hear that a lot of the companies say, oh, don't worry, it was only your email address or your passwords or your users' names. So a lot of those don't get reported in the breaches you hear. Um, don't you use your password to sign on to your accounts? Isn't the first thing you put in your email? So these are all pieces of your personal life that the bad guys are able to put together from various sources to try to pretend to be you. So it is a big deal when these non-sensitive pieces of information are leaked from companies who have their systems breached. Different types of identity theft were 
basically going to fo focus on financial fraud tonight, but I want to go over all the different kinds. So financial fraud is where a criminal tries to open a credit card in your name, tries to uh, drain the money out of your credit union, tries to open a cellular phone account in your name, that sort of thing. That's financial fraud, and that is the t tries to take over your bank account or your credit card account. That's the number one type of fraud when it comes to identity theft. The second is, is criminal identity theft, probably, thankfully, the least um, uh, percentage of the crime because that's where they pretend to be you. That's something where it will probably live with you for the rest of your life. They pretend to be you. And I actually interviewed a woman once who had a criminal be, pre, pretend to be her. She was driving along the road, was pulled over by a cop for a speeding ticket, and was literally taken away in handcuffs because they thought she was the criminal who was on the loose. And she now travels and will for the rest of her life with a letter in her pocket or a purse from the DA and the police chief explaining that she's the victim of identity theft and she's not the criminal that they're looking for. Pretty bad way to live your life always looking over your shoulder, but in some cases that's what happens. There's medical fraud. This is a growing area right now, and this is where they try to use your records to get medical services to either use for themselves or sell. So they may get medical durable supplies. They may get like uh, wheelchairs and sell them and make money off of them. They may get oxycodone drugs and sell them on the black market. They may get medical treatments and have it put on your medical account. And the, the bad part about that is if they have something done, it can get into your medical record and then you go to the hospital or, uh, and something happens to you and your blood type got changed because a criminal had something done somewhere else and it changed your record, your health record that you weren't aware of. So I interviewed for a story on medical identity theft a, a teenager who uh, was, wanted to take part in a blood drive for her high school and they turned her down and said, I'm sorry, but you can't do that, you have AIDS. And she goes, no, I don't have AIDS. And it's like, well, the record says you have AIDS. Well, what happened was, is that some person in another state had gotten her medical records and was indeed getting AIDS treatment on her medical record, and this information got commingled with her legitimate medical record. It took her and her parents a couple of months to get this thing straightened out with the Red Cross. They finally did. But imagine if you were rushed to the hospital and, had, and all of a sudden it said you were allergic to a drug that could save your life and you weren't allergic to the drug that could save your life. These, these, these things could be life-threatening. Child identity theft is another growing area. One million kids had their identity stolen last year. A million. Uh, and bad guys want the identity theft of a child because it's clean. It's a perfect record. It's a clean slate. Chances are the parents and the kid will never check their credit report until they want to apply for something when they get old enough, like a credit, their first credit card, their first bank account, their first account at a credit union, their first car loan, something like that. And then they see there's a lot of problems. So they're able to use these accounts and run with them for many, many years. So child identity theft is a key. I will go over it later when I talk about credit freezes. But for you or your grandkids, kids, tell your kids, kids, kid, tell your kids, everybody in the family should have their credit file frozen, including the kids. And thanks to a law passed by Congress uh, last session, everybody, including kids, can now have their accounts frozen. Whoops, I went backwards. And then, okay. So I want you to meet this guy. This is Brett Shannon Johnson. Brett is one of the all-time former cyber thieves. He started what became the dark web today. Brett was the guy who takes credit for coming up with uh, tax fraud. He figured out that the death rolls uh, computers and the tax computers of the IRS were not talking to each other many, many, way back when, and so he came up with the idea of let's collect uh, refunds for people who are dead. And he got away with it for a long time until now they start to compare the records and they came up with other ways to commit tax fraud. Uh, I had a chance to interview Brett. He's now a consultant. Uh, he spent six and a half years behind bars and saw the light. And now he is uh, a consultant to companies such as Microsoft and some other big tech companies to teach them what the bad guys are doing in cyberspace. And I think you'll find it uh, fascinating to hear from him how easy it is to steal your information. I was stealing a lot of money when I was a criminal. Um, <clears throat> I didn't make a living, I stole money. And that got to $160,000 a week. How easy is it to commit identity theft these days, to be a cyber criminal? Extremely easy. So what happens is, is for $2.90, you can buy someone's social and date of birth. 
All right. Uh, from there, you go to any number of legal websites like Ben Verified or Spokio or White Pages, and you start pulling background checks on the person. Once you have the background checks done, that gives you enough information to get the credit report online. Once you have the credit report, you have the entire identity profile. Criminals call that a fool's. And at that point, you commit any type of crime you want to commit. Uh, for a person beginning cybercrime, they can go in, they can buy tutorials. There are classes that are being taught. For $600, you can take a six-week class from an experienced fraudster. The fraudster walks you through every single thing you need to do, holds your hand doing it, and guarantees you that you'll make money doing this technique, or he gives you your money back. I know one of your tips is make sure you freeze your credit accounts because that's one of the only proactive ways to protect yourself these days. Right, and I, I believe in a proactive, not a reactive response. So freeze your credit, freeze everyone in the house's credit because kids are the number one victims of identity theft. One in four children will be a victim of ID theft. So you freeze the credit of everyone, that takes care of all new account fraud. Now that doesn't take care of existing accounts. So on top of that, you need to monitor every single account you've got. Yes, every single account, credit cards, banks, uh, email addresses, every single account you need to monitor. You need to put alerts on every single card you've got. For example, Discover has a zero dollar alert so that if you swipe a Discover card with no charge, you still get a text message saying it was swiped. The reason you do that is if a criminal steals your credit card. Now, he may not be able to build a, a complete profile on that because you've got a credit freeze, but he can still use the card. So you need to have the monitoring on there and that alert on there so that when he swipes the card or makes an online order or anything else, you get the text message, I didn't make that order, and you can call the issuing bank and say, hey, we've got fraud on the line. A lot of people deal with the overload of passwords by creating really simple passwords and then using them on site after site after site. I would assume that's exactly what the cyber criminals love. Love it. Uh, criminals love that. The thing is, is that you as an individual, you may pay attention to your bank account. So if you receive a, a phishing email from a bank account, you'll know, no, I'm not going to respond to that. That's, that's fraud. Somebody's trying to get my password. But if you're using the same password, say, on your Netflix account or something like that, dating account, anything like that, well, if you get a phishing email from that, your defenses are lowered because who's going to send out a phishing email like that? Well, hundreds of cyber criminals do every single day. So if you're using the same password, they have your password, they have your login, they try your bank account, then they have access to that. What I advise people to do, because most people, even myself, I don't know how to pick a secure password. So I use a password manager like LastPass. There, there's all kinds of password managers you can use. They have a lot of trust in digital technology. They believe what they see on the internet. They believe what they see in their email. What is your advice to them? My advice is to look at me. I, I'm the guy that, that used to rip people off and I'm not the worst one. There are people out there, there are, there are pedophiles out there, there are financial criminals out there, there are people out there who will break in your home. It's important to understand that yes, the internet gives distance, but that distance also lowers your defenses. And when you lower your defenses, you're talking too much, you're sharing too much information, you need to be aware that you can be victimized. Cybercrime has gotten to the point now that a lot of it is local. So for financial cybercrime, Criminals are buying local credit cards or using local identity information. And the same thing happens for physical crime online. So someone's looking at your Facebook account. If you go on vacation and say, hey, I'm going to Paris for a week. Well, somebody's going to notice that if you're sharing that information to the public. And what happens? If you come back and your house is broken in, where do you think they got the information that you were gone from your Facebook account? Same thing goes on. I'm, I'm an avid user of LinkedIn. Uh, Criminals use LinkedIn every day to find out where people work, what your employer is, because that's a piece of information you need to commit crime. So you need to be aware of the information you share and always have your defenses up. Just because it's internet doesn't mean it's safe at all. Quite the opposite. So that's the, uh, the brutal reality of, of where things stand. Just to uh, go over a few things he said, because he said a lot of things. You don't have to be a hacker anymore to commit identity fraud. They sell the stuff, ready-made kits. You buy the kits for several hundred dollars. They teach you how to do it. What do you want to do? Do you want to rip off the credit union? Do you want to steal credit card numbers? Do you want to steal passwords? What do you want to do? We got it here for you. And then the marketplace and the dark web for the stuff they steal 
is commoditized into marketplaces. There are literally stores on the dark web that sell stolen credit card numbers or stolen uh, so security numbers or stolen debit card numbers. You can buy them by zip code. You can buy them by bank or credit union. They guarantee them. If for some reason they don't work, they'll give you your money back. We're talking big time organized global crime here. That is what we're up against. Again, we don't need to freak out, but we need to take this seriously, and we've gotta be very careful with what we do, and usually that means slowing down and taking a few more seconds to do something. It's not as convenient as being careless and carefree, but I can tell you from the people I've spoken to, once you're the victim, it's a lot harder than to prevent it on the front end. So my goal here is to get us to be proactive, as he said, and prevent it on the front end. Now I'm gonna go through a number of things that you can do. Feel free to take notes, but the sheet of paper you have that lists the stories on my website and the URLs, almost everything I talk about where I say get password managers or get this or get that, if you go to that story, uh, use that URL to go on the web, you will get that information. All the links are in the story. So, because I don't always provide the links with everything I talk about. So that's why I, I gave that to you. So credit freeze versus credit lock. Here's the difference. Um, the credit freeze is the best thing you can do, as he talked about, to protect yourself. It locks your credit file at the credit bureau, which means unless someone has a PIN, that you are the only person who has the PIN, they cannot get in to access the file, which means no one can run a credit check on you, which means no one can open up a, a account, a get a loan, an account, a credit card, a debit card, a checking account, a, a wireless account, a Comcast account, whatever, without getting that uh, check run. Can't run rent an apartment in most cases. So that locks that down. It is absolutely free. Uh, Congress passed a law last session. The only thing Congress did for consumers in the last session was to pass the credit freeze law. It is free. It is virtually instantaneous if you do it online, and it is virtually instantaneous if you want to unlock it. So if you go to buy a car when it's the BECU car sale, and you go, uh-oh, my credit, my free, my file's frozen, all you have to do is go on your mobile device or go online, and you can put a temporary free uh, thaw on that account, a day, two days, three days, whatever you want, usually within 30 minutes, the account is open again, they can run a credit check on you, you can get the car, you can get the car loan, you can get the credit card, you can have Macy's give you the 20% discount if you apply for their credit card on the spot if that's what you really want to do. So in the old days, it took a long, long time. It was a very tedious process and you had to pay for it, $10 every single time you froze or thawed. Now it's completely free as for you, every member of your family and your kids, but everybody's got to do it. Uh, it does not impact your credit score. A lot of people are afraid of that. No impact on the score whatsoever. And it's federally regulated fraud protection. There are rules that the credit bureaus have to follow when you do this procedure that are outlined by federal regulation. It's a federally regulated situation. What the credit bureaus are trying to get you to do is they are trying to, give you to get you to do a credit lock. That is a product that they came up with that possibly had some benefits back when credit freezes were a pain in the butt, but they're not anymore. So in my opinion, there is no reason in the world to have these credit locks. Some of them are really simple. As you see, you can use those little, on your mobile device, you can swipe and do that kind of thing. They're not federally regulated. The company can change the rules at any time, as Equifax did recently with its program. Uh, they can also use your information to market you financial products. And trust me, they will every week or three or four times a week market you financial products. So there's no reason in the world to get one of these products from the credit bureaus anymore. Uh, it's exactly the same thing as the credit freeze, except it is not federally regulated and you can expect to have your in-bin filled with ads from the credit bureau. So go with a credit freeze. You go online to each of the three credit bureaus, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. You go to the page that says credit freeze, you do that for you, and then every member of your family would have to do it as well. Yes, you have to give them your social security number because that's how they track your credit file. You do it from a secure computer, like your home computer. You don't do it on Wi-Fi at Starbucks. You don't do it when you're in a hotel in Cleveland and you have some time on your vacation. You don't do it from the library a computer that could have malware in it. You do it from your secure home computer or some computer that you know that is safe. Everybody always asks me about credit monitoring. What do I think about credit monitoring? If you have the money and you want to do it and it gives you peace of mind, be my guest. It cannot stop identity theft. No matter what the ads indicate to you, it cannot stop identity theft. It can only alert you to a possible problem if the crime has taken place. 
And despite all the ads, and I just wrote a huge article for NBC about this two weeks ago, and it's on my website, consumerman.com, all this talk about we search the dark web, we search the dark web, they can't remove anything from the dark web where the criminals hang out. They cannot remove anything that's already there. And most of their scans do not find what's on the dark web because the stuff is password protected by the bad guys and they can only find out the stuff that's being discussed in the chat room. So again, most of what they do is meaningless. It's hype. It's used to sell you a product that if you want to spend the money and you want a little bit of extra protection, be my guest but you certainly do not need it, and they certainly do not monitor anything. And the million dollar guarantee, most identity theft does not involve money that comes out of your pocket. If your credit card is stolen and used, the, the financial institution handles the loss. If, you're, if you really had money drained from your checking account, it was fraud, the financial institution helps you work with it. So this million dollar guarantee, I don't know if they've ever paid it, but it really sounds good when they talk about it in the ads. So don't let that, that it's just total marketing hype. And that's what bothers me about these services, which is the way that they sell their product. Uh, LifeLock has just been purchased by uh, Norton Symantec, the big antivirus company. They've sort of cleaned up their act a little bit or working to do that recently. So I'm, I'm happy to see that. But the guy used to write his social security number, the LifeLock guy used to write his on a van, he used to go around. He came to me in, in Seattle and he wrote on the wall on a whiteboard and showed it to everybody. And I pointed out that he had his identity stolen twice. So that was really wasn't a smart thing to do. Uh, so you don't be giving out your, it's just the hype that, it, that deals with these things. So let's go down with some things you can do. You heard me say it before, and I'll say it again. Be proactive. Get your credit reports. Annualcreditreport.com is where you go. It was set up by the federal government. It's where you go to get your credit report. You can get one free credit report every 12 months from each of those three credit bureaus, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. If you want to be really smart, and I'd be happy if you just did it once a year, but you could stagger them and do them every four months. Do one Equifax, four months later, do TransUnion, four months later, do Experian, and then you're always checking your credit because things may be different in different files. If most Americans would just do it once a year, it would be a big uh, progress from where we stand right now. What do you do when you get that? You are looking for something that's not right. A wrong home address, a wrong work address, a credit card you don't have, a bankruptcy you never had. Anything that is wrong that jumps out at you, that means there's a very good chance either it's erroneous information or a criminal is using your identity and doing something bad and you need to get that taken care of right away. You need to check your financial accounts. And you should be, you know, everybody says once a day. I don't check my financial accounts once a day. But once a week, once every seven to 10 days, go online and check your financial accounts and just make sure everything is okay. Do it with your, you know, the BECU account, do it with your credit card account. If you have a bank account, just, just look at these things and make sure everything's okay. Because the faster you deal with identity theft, the less the damage is and the quicker you can get yourself back on your feet again. And then check your medical billing statements. I told you the medical ID theft is one of the biggest things now. So we all get those, we all get those things say, this is not a bill, right? Get that in every month from the insurance company or Medicare or whatever. And what do you do? It says, this is not a bill. You, you don't even look at it, you throw it away. No, no, that's your first line of defense. Look at that and just glance over it. And if you had an appendectomy in Cleveland and you never were in Cleveland and you still have your appendix, uh, that means somebody probably stole your medical file and is using your medical history to have medical identity theft take place. If all of a sudden you have like 100 uh, oxycodone on there and you don't use oxycodone, somebody is probably using your medical identity to be a drug pusher. So just skim it. Just look on there for anything that does not belong. It's an early warning sign that you're the victim of medical identity theft. Monitor your credit scores. Most of us are almost at an age, many of us in the room, that we don't really are taking out that many loans anymore, so we're really not concerned about our credit scores. But here's the deal. If you set up, Todd, does, do you give a free credit score to everybody every month? Okay, so if you get your free FICO score every month, that's great. Very good thing, service. So if you get the, check your FICO score. If you're, if you're cruising along and your FICO score is really good, you're, you know, 740, 760, whatever, and nothing has changed in your life, and all of a sudden you go the next month and check it, and you're 650, 690, that's a warning sign that something's wrong. Maybe somebody took a credit card out of your name and is running up the bill and that screwed up your credit score. Maybe somebody did something and had put something else on your name that you have no idea about. So besides, so you don't really need to worry about your credit score if you're not 
doing anything in the credit field, but it is an early warning sign for identity theft. And that's how I use my credit score, just to keep an eye on where things are and that somebody may be doing something. You heard him talk about setting up security alerts. This is the page you'll find on BECU. And it's really easy. You tell their computer what you want them to do. So you can do this on your checking account. You can do this on your credit card accounts. Uh, some financial institutions let you do this. I have it set up in my account that it tells me anytime my credit card is used for a foreign transaction, because I'm not doing foreign transactions, I have it tell me every time some money is taken out of the ATM, I instantaneously, via text and email, know when my wife takes money out of the ATM to the second. I know that that, not that I'm checking up on you, honey, but I, I know that. If uh, if someone uh, makes a, you, if I have a check uh, that's written above, t uh, process that's above $250, you can set it at whatever level you want. I get an instantaneous alert that there's a, a check that's drawn a, uh, above my profile. Uh, if there's a credit card account above a certain amount, if there's a credit card uh, not present, so if it's an online transaction where all cyber fraud is moving right now online, I get an instantaneous alert. Again, the quicker you know there's a problem, the faster you can deal with it. So I urge you to do that with all of your accounts, your BECU account, whatever else you have, a credit card account, uh, if you have a regular bank account, whatever, do that. It's one of the best things you can do. All right, we're gonna end up with fighting back and then I'm gonna be able to take some questions from you. It's, everybody thinks that cyber theft, or, or that identity theft is all cyber, it's all hacking, it's all computers. Cyber thieves are criminals, criminals like easy. You know, they like to break into the car that's not locked. They like to steal the car that has the key, the ignition on when in the parking, in your parking garage or in your, in your uh, driveway when you're warming it up in the morning. Same thing with identity thieves. If you have a mailbox that's not locked, and this is one of these low-level identity thieves that steals mail, they get credit cards or account numbers, that's where they're going to go, to the easy pickings. I live in Bellevue, very good, safe neighborhood. I have a locking mailbox. Twice last summer, identity thieves came through and stole all the mail in the mailboxes. And we found piles of mail at the end of the, uh, the cul-de-sac. Didn't get my mail. I got a locking mailbox. It's 50 bucks. It's best 50 bucks you can spend. And you don't put mail in your mailbox anymore to go out. You know, put that red flag up. That doesn't say, hello, postman, my mail's out. It says, hi, cyber crook, uh, hi, identity thief. I got something in here you might want to steal. So unfortunately, you've got to either have it go out through the locking mailbox or take it to the post office and put it in one of those blue boxes. Uh, there's a lo I, I interviewed one of these people in Seattle who work, who work in Seattle, and I mean, they would do main streets, cars gone by, they're going in and pulling stuff out of mailboxes, nobody stopped them, they had no compunction against doing it, it was, you know, unbelievable. Some of these people are, you know, are addicts and they need to make money, so they're not afraid to, to do anything. Get a good cross-cut shredder. Shred anything with personal information on it before you put it in the recycle bin. Now, if you shred it, we're supposed to put it in the compost bin now. Uh, but shred it and then put it in the compost bin so that somebody can't get a hold of your documents. Never respond to phone calls or email that request personal information. I don't care what story the person gives you on the other end of the line. They could claim that they're the IRS. They could claim they're Social Security. They could claim that they're Medicare. They could claim they're BECU's fraud department. They could claim that they're Macy's. They could claim that they're Citibank. They could claim that the King County Sheriff's is a Homish County. I don't care who, who they claim to be. I don't care what caller ID says, because caller ID is not secure. Any crook can make caller ID say whatever they want it to say. So if they're telling you they're calling from BECU, it will say BECU. If they're telling you they're calling from the IRS, it will say 1-800-IRS or whatever the, the phone number they wanted to say. It's all part of the scam. And no one who is legitimate, BECU, you ask anybody here, they would never call you and say, hi, I need your account number, I need your password, I need your PIN code, ever. We, they already have it. Anybody who needs this stuff has it. So I don't care what story they give you, our computer's down, we think somebody's fraudulently using your card, somebody's claiming your tax refund, I don't care what it is. No one from a legitimate organization would ever call you and not, you would not know who they really are and ask you for this information on the phone. Only a con artist would do that. Hang up right away. If curiosity is going to kill the cat, then pick up the, 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 go online, find out the legitimate number of the organization and call them. Call the IRS, call BECU, call uh, your credit card company, call the kink. Did you just call me? Did, was there something going on? It'll tell you no, that was a con artist on the line. You were really smart to hang up. Don't click links or open attachments unless you're 100% that they're legitimate. And 
There's two ways that they get things on your computer, malware, that can steal all your personal information. They can put malware on your computer, malicious software that tracks every single keystroke you do, every thing, single thing you do. They can watch your monitor. They can turn your camera on. They can pick up every keystroke you make to steal all of your personal information. So when you get out of the blue an email that says, Federal Express or U.S. Postal Service had trouble delivering this package to you, click the attachment. Don't click the attachment if you aren't expecting a, a, Fed or a FedEx or a, a whatever. Call them. Call them on the phone and find out. Because if you click that and it is malicious, the software will get loaded on your computer. You'll never know it. You won't know the bad stuff is on there. And they will be seeing potentially every single thing you're doing. So a lot of the, uh, so the attachments are one way. And the second way is to click a link. I know I'm, I'm more anal than most people, but unless I know you were going to send me something right away and there's a link in that thing, I don't click it. Because when they steal those emails that are non-important information, they can pretend to be you with that email and send me the email because they know they can steal contacts and stuff and send me an email from one of my friends that says, hey, look at this picture, click this link. You click the link and all of a sudden you're either on a bad website or malicious software is automatically downloaded onto your computer. So I've literally at times, when I wasn't expecting something, would call a friend and say, did you just send me this thing that you wanted me to read this article in the New York Times or whatever? And, they, and they'll say yes. Or I'll just, if they say, look at this article in the New York Times, and I know the topic, and I really want to read it, I'll Google it and just get the article that way. But that's the second way, just randomly clicking stuff, you know. And, and there's been a lot of criticism, and it's valid that the entire financial world um, you know, they, every month they send, they send you an email that says, click here to get your bank statement. That's got to stop. The financial world has got to figure out another way to do that. Say, like, go, on, go online and click and, and log on to your account because they're teaching us the wrong behavior. There's been a whole lot of talk about that in the consumer press recently. It's, it's something that they really, it's just not the right way to do it anymore. Uh, and here's an example of if you click on something and you don't know what it is. So see that little link there? It says, click, it says, click here. If you put your cursor over it, that was a link that went to a Russian website. It wasn't TurboTax, it was Russian. You would have given them all your personal information. These are very common. These are, that's a phishing scam. For those of you who hadn't seen a, you heard the word phishing scam, that's a phishing scam. It looks exactly like the real thing. It may have a lot of your personal information on it because they stole it. They may know the ending of your account number. They may know the ending of your credit card number. They may have your email address. But if you click the link, the hidden link, that's where it's going to take you to some place it's bad. And those little tiny links now, you know how they shrink the links so it's like only a couple letters? You don't know where you're going. It's really dangerous, really, really dangerous when you get those little links. All right, final thoughts. As we are all living in a digital world, as I told the young people when I talked to them, there is no undo button. When I started consumer reporting in 1981 here in Seattle, I, would do, I remember I did a story about oil and gas well scams. And I got off the TV, and I got to my desk, and the phone rang, and a gentleman called me up, and he said, thank you. I just wrote that company a check for $10,000. I'm going out in the mailbox, and I'm going to pull the letter out because it's going to go out in the morning. Or and somebody else called and said, I'm stopping payment on the check. I just mailed it yesterday. You could do that in the old days. Things were not instantaneous. Now, if you put your Social Security number on a website, or you put your account number and go click Submit, gone. No getting it back, no changing it, no saying, whoops, I just gave a bad guy my social security number. It's out there. It's gone. It's done. So you really have to think before you do anything. There's no going back in this digital world. Anything done digitally can be stolen. Anything. I try to tell the kids this, you know, that they have these apps. Oh, it disappears in six seconds or eight seconds. You know, first of all, somebody can take a screenshot of it in the six seconds before it disappears. And second of all, if it's on a server somewhere, it's there somewhere. Things can always come back to haunt you. So if it's something that you really don't want out there, don't ever put it digitally. Because if you do it digitally, someday it could come back to haunt you. It's, it's just it, they live forever and it can be stolen. Looks can be deceiving. As you saw from that, that example I gave you, the Fisher scam, they are really good now. I mean, the old days, there were typos. They had the, you could tell that they cut and paste the logo. Um, you can't tell anymore. You cannot tell that these things are fake. Sometimes they even actually link you to the real website, and the real website is compromised, the financial institution website, and then they just take you through a back door to their, to their bad site. So you've just got to be really, really careful and really, really skeptical. You know, did BEC really send me an email and told me that I just want a million dollars and all I have to do is send them $5,000 to pay the taxes? Nope, they would never do that. 
So you just have to stop and think and be smart enough to realize that that's not going to happen. By the way, for testimonials and all these things, they steal faces off the Internet and just put them on these things. Hey, I tried this. It really worked. Hey, I made a million dollars. They just go and cut and paste people's. I've seen things where it's like the same guy on 10 different scams. They just take his picture, and the poor guy, he gets people like, you know, hate mail from people. Why are you trying to rip me off? It's like, geez, they just they took my Facebook picture. Sorry about that. So uh, this is important in in, in all kinds of aspects of your life, but use protection. And by that I mean that you need to have security software on every digital device. You need to have it on your laptop, you need to have it on your desktop, you need to have it on your tablet, you need to have it on your smartphone, which is your portable computer and probably has most of your life on it. And uh, many, many people, especially if you have Android phones, Apples are a little more secure. You better have some kind of security software on there. One that I use and I like is called Lookout, L-O-O-K-O-U-T. It's free. You can upgrade to the premium service. Basically, it scans your apps. It scans your email for, for malicious stuff. It can lock up your phone from remotely. So on your desktop, you can go and lock. If somebody, you lose your phone, you can lock up your phone, and you can erase the hard drive if it gets lost or stolen, and you can also find it. There are a bunch of them like that, but Lookout is just the one that I've used and I know about, and I find it reassuring to have it there. So you ha And if you have security software and you're paying for a subscription and you're not either having it download every single day automatically or you let the subscription la lapse, the analogy I give, it's like, um, it's like a condom with holes in it. I mean, that's basically what it is. You're not getting protection anymore, okay, because there are hundreds of thousands of viruses released on the Internet every single day. So if you have a subscription, you've got to keep it up to date, and you've got to let your computer automatically update every single day. One day gone, it's one day that's out of date, and you're, you're vulnerable. Beware of public Wi-Fi. There's a reason why it's called public, because everybody can see what you're doing. You do not check your BECU account at Starbucks. You do not check it at the public Wi-Fi at the hotel when you're on vacation. You need to, if you do, you need to do that from a secure Wi-Fi connection. If you travel and you need to do that, what you do is you get yourself what's called a VPN, a virtual private network. I just was traveling and I had to do some work for NBC, so I had to get online and do things. So I downloaded one. It's called NordVPN. It's one of the top-rated virtual private networks. Uh, I think they had a sale. I spent $104 for three years' service. And it protects me. What it does is everything leaving my computer gets encrypted till it gets to the Wi-Fi. So if anybody intercepted that Wi-Fi, if anybody saw what I was doing, every single thing I sent out was encrypted, and it would be absolutely meaningless to them. So either wait till you get home or, and don't do it at a public Wi-Fi or um, get a VPN and do it that way. It's the only two safe ways to get on the Internet. Good password hygiene. We, he talked about that in the video. It needs to be strong and unique. Here are the worst passwords of 2018. One, two, three, four, five, six. Good old password. That's right up there. Somebody wanted to make it really strong, so they put an eight and a seven, eight, and a nine on it. Uh, ABC123 or 123ABC. Uh, and admin. And then there's admin one. The terrible passwords. Terrible. And the bad guys know this. And he was telling me that crook, he was telling me they have, a, they have algorithms. So he would set it up, he'd go to sleep at night, and by the time he woke up in the morning, the algorithm had cra I mean, he could do millions of computations an hour or a minute. He, he'd wake up and have all the passwords cracked. I mean, it's not like there's some guy sitting there and trying to figure out that your password is Joe327. They're running high-powered algorithms that can figure all this stuff out. So it's got to be complicated. At least 12 characters. If you can do more, the better. Mix of letters, numbers, and symbols, uppercase, lowercase, nothing obvious. One of the ones that's really popular now is let me in. Oh, boy, no one would ever figure that out. Uh, adding a one, you know, a lot of companies make, uh, make us change our passwords on a regular basis, like every 30 or 60 days, which is actually now considered bad password hygiene because what it does is convince people to use simple passwords that they can remember. So, you, so what you do is you take your password, like let's say it's password, and you put password one. Or do you put one password? He said, don't you think our algorithms like check for that? <laughs> you know, they, they do all that kind of stuff. So you can't take the same password. If you have to update it for some reason, like put a one at the end or a one at the beginning, you've got to completely change the password. And no patterns or simple phrases. Uh, you know, it's like uh, if you went to Georgia Tech and you, you, know, you wouldn't put I'm a rambling wreck because they, they look at these or singing in the rain. You, don't, you wouldn't put a movie title. Uh, anything that their, their algorithms would spot. 
what you should do is you'd use a password manager and you should get a password manager. Uh, the average American has 150 passwords now. Nobody could possibly remember all those passwords, so we use weak passwords like password and repeat them over and over again. That is the worst thing you could possibly do. Get a password manager. I have an article on the thing about password managers, and I'll give you a list of some of them in a minute. And what you do is the password manager will let you use the password generator, which you see here, and you can generate a really strong password. You can tell it, I want it 12 characters, I want it 12, 20 characters, I want uppercase, I want lowercase. It's a, it's a gibberish like you see there that you would never remember, but you don't have to remember. The password manager remembers it, and when you go to, say, fast, when you go to Facebook, it automatically puts the password in for you. And it works on your laptop, your desktop, your cell phone, your tablet, whatever device you're using, it does it automatically for you. All you have to remember is one password, one really long and strong password that gets you into the password manager. And don't forget it, write it down, stick it in a mayonnaise jar and put it on your back deck or whatever because if you lose that, they won't let you in because they don't know that it's, I mean, you're gonna have to go through a lot of work to get back in again because they don't want a criminal pretending to be you. So everything being stored on their server is encrypted, so if somebody does breach the, the server, all they get is encrypted data. Yes, there's a risk in this world of something happening, but the risk of everybody using password one, two, three versus having really, really strong passwords, uh, it's, it's a risk-benefit analysis, and this is the way I'm going, and it, it seems to make a, a whole lot of sense. If you don't want to go that route, then the only other way you do it is you do what's called password triage. Take the five or six or seven most important passwords that you have for your financial accounts, usually your email account and maybe your social media account, and make really, really complicated, strong passwords for those. Don't repeat them, only one per, per site. And if you have to, stick them on a piece of paper and stick them in a tablet and put them in your desk drawer and the odds that somebody's gonna break into your house and find that tablet and know what they're for is, 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 is less than you doing password one, two, three. So it, it's got to be one of those, one of those kind of cost-benefit analysis. But um, it's, it's really, really critical to do. Here are the password managers. Again, most of them are free. LastPass, Dashlane, Sticky Password, RoboForm, KeyPass, TrueKey, and LogBee once. Again, my article that's on the sheet that has it has, tells you all about password managers uh, and, uh, and where you and direct links to these things. I strongly recommend you go that direction. A couple last little things. Everybody's got a chip card now, right? Okay. I'm happy to report that chip cards are actually working. Chip cards, the latest report that came out a couple of months ago, chip cards have cut point of service fraud at the terminal, people using fake counterfeit credit cards, by 60%, six zero. So they did everything that we would hope they would do. Here's the problem. The bad guys don't need a chip card to go on the internet and buy things online, which is what we all predicted would happen because it's what happened in Europe and Canada. So now all, most of the fraud has migrated online and they're using the, the stolen account numbers online. The websites are doing a better job with algorithms. The credit card companies are really doing a much better job with algorithms of catching this thing at a faster pace. I mean, they will, they'll now catch fraud $50, $100, $200, where in the old days it was seven to 10 grand. So they're getting a lot better at that. Doesn't mean that's not gonna be a hassle for you. So that's why we always say check your account once a week, and if you see a charge on there that's suspicious, you didn't make, you're not sure, call the bank or the credit card company, the credit union, whoever has your, who has your card, and say, I got a problem with this charge, and I, I, I'm, I think it's fraud. Can you look into it for me? Can you pull it off my account? And they will be there to help you. The other problem that is still around is called skimming. And I'm sure you've heard about that. That's where you put your credit card or debit card in, and there's a reader that reads the magnetic stripe, which again, most times they can't make a card anymore, but they can get that information to use it to shop online. Uh, that's what you see there is the, it looks just like what should be on the, uh, the reader, and that goes on top of it. So when you slide your card in there, the little computer chip in there reads your credit card and grabs your PIN number and then sends it back to the bad guy. The really vulnerable things, and, and by the way, do you, can you tell which one of those has got the, uh, has got the skimmer on it? Yep, right there. They just add a little piece on it. And they say to jiggle it and do some stuff, but sometimes they're so good you can't figure it out. The real problem right now is gas pumps. Gasoline pumps are highly vulnerable. They're not required to accept chip cards until 2020. And when I did a story in a couple of years ago, there were only like five keys that open every single gasoline pump in the world. 
uh, so they can get they can steal the key and open the pump and stick in a little computer device so I don't even have to use a skimmer and automatically just send all the credit card and debit card data back uh, highly and, and you know a lot of places 24 hours are not manned or you know there's nobody there they can get in put in nobody sees and no, nobody knows what's going on uh, my advice is I would never use anything but a credit card at a gas pump because credit card you're working with the financial institutions money not yours I would never ever use a debit card at, a, at a, a gasoline station. And if you gotta use a debit card, go inside and see the person and let them swipe it in front of you so you know that it's done that way securely. But this is, I, I did a story a couple years ago in um, Puyallup and they had skimmers in the Arco stations and they, to show you how much data they have, they don't need to use it right away. They sat on those numbers for one year until they used them. All of a sudden a year later, Everybody's, well, where's this charge coming from? What's going on now? And, they, and when the cops finally tracked it back, they realized they'd stolen that data a year earlier and sat on it that long before they used it. So just be really careful of that. Uh, you will find all of my stories on my website, consumerman.com. What I do is basically set it up to post all my NBC stories because in the digital world, you can't find anything anymore after it's been published in 24 hours. Uh, you can also, if you go there, sign up for my newsletter. I send it out once a week. It basically tells you what stories I did for Como, what stories I did for NBC News. I do not share, sell, rent, or borrow. I let anybody borrow my, my mailing list. It's me and Sam are the only two people who see it. Sam's my dog, and he's not giving it to anybody. So uh, if you, and that's just a proactive way of knowing what's going on every week. You get a little nice little note new from the consumer man, and I'll tell you what's going on. It's a way to sort of stay up to date on the, on the things that are going on. Uh, I am told to allow some time for questions, so I'd be happy to answer any question you have. Either belt it out or please use the microphone so that everybody can hear you, and especially the folks at home. Why don't you go use them? Because we got the people watching on the WWW. Okay, you, said, you said that uh, you should do the credit freeze for every person. My grandchild was less than a year old, and we were told that you have to be at least a year old before they'll put a credit freeze on. Has that changed? <sighs> I, d I don't know the answer to that question. It may be that you have to be a year old. Uh, when did you try to do it? Was it recently? Uh, it was uh, about a year ago. Just okay, so the law changed. I I'm not sure, but the law did change in September. So it may be easier now. And it's certainly, if you can't do it until they're one year old, absolutely make a note of your calendar or do it at one year old. I, I will look into that, but I I'd never heard that. But thank you for letting me know about that. Thank so, you. Okay. So I'm going to stay on the same line of questioning. Hi. Oh, hello. Um, yeah, so I think I have what's called a credit lock. And I'm in this cycle where you have to pay 15 bucks every time you want to unlock it, refreeze uh, it, blah, blah, blah. Uh -huh. How do I get rid of that and move to the credit freeze? Uh, we'll go to whatever, find out whatever company's billing Equifax. you for it. Huh? Equifax. Okay, Equifax. Uh, go, go on the Equifax website and cancel your subscription. And then you go back to Equifax and you do a credit freeze, okay. which is free. So if you're asked to put in a credit card number, ask for any money, you went somewhere wrong. Okay. But the credit freeze is absolutely 100% free. Great. Okay? And every person in the family. Yes, okay. every person in the family. Dogs, dogs and cats, not necessarily, but yeah, okay. Who else? Yes, ma'am. Question. Um, what is my responsibility for prior resident credit card offers? Where I, we moved into a new place. Right. We keep getting mail for them for credit card offers. What is my responsibility for that. Right. I'm not a lawyer, but I would assume if it's not if it's not you, you're not responsible for them. My suggestion is either um, try to I would try to talk to the postal service if you could, or just make sure you shred them so that so just to be a good citizen that something's not happening to them. But if it's not coming in your name, you don't have to worry about it. Um, I, I I get that every once in a while too from people who lived in my house like. 25 years ago or whatever, and it's, it's weird how long emails, mailing lists go on, and I just shred it because I know they don't want it and, and get rid of it. One other question uh -huh. is the credit freeze, does it opt you out of credit card offers? The credit freeze um, does not always opt you out of credit card offers uh, because some of them are, are looking at pre-screen things and not the actual credit score. They'll look, they're, they're telling the credit agencies, give us a group of people who might qualify for this. The way to go out to, go to that is a, there's a service called Opt Out. If you Google this, like opt out pre screen or whatever, so and, do that and, and do, I would do that in addition. Yeah. And, and the ones, and no matter what you do, if you have a business relationship, um, unless you tell them to stop, if you have an airline credit card, if, I mean, if you have an airline uh, membership, if you have a hotel membership, if you have those kind of things, odds are because you're a member, they're going to send you the credit card offers um, and, and just 
you know, you, you might get, be able to get them to stop, but assume you're going to get them no matter what you do. And I just shred them as soon as they come in. So I'm not as freaked out about those as I was in the old days when they used to send live checks all the time. And that was really because anybody could take that check various th and, and write the check and, and you were instantaneously responsible. That, that has basically died down now. It's just the pre-screened offers that are coming. Okay, thank you. Hello, I have Hi. Two, two questions. Okay. So you had said there was for a cell phone lockout was what you put on your cell phone? Lookout, L-O-O-K-O-U-T. -O -O and so what would you recommend for a laptop is, is for something for security for that? Do you have any recommendations for that? Well, I mean, what I would do is, because it changes every single year, go to a website like uh, PC World or PC Magazine or CNET, and s every year they rate the best virus programs. Consumer Reports rates the best virus programs. It changes every single year. I mean, some of the big names like Norton uh, is, a, is a really good one uh, that everybody likes. Uh, there's one called Avast. If you're a Comcast subscriber, you get uh, Norton free as part of your service, so I don't have to put a thing on my home computer, it's already part of, of my package with Comcast. Um, but stick with a big name, or if you just want to see what's out there, the, one of those sites that compares them every year, they all, and they're just, you know, they came out with new ratings at the beginning of 2019, so it'll be best, you know, secure, look for a security suite, best secu so you want one product, so you want a security suite that looks for malware, virus, so just say like best security suites for 2019 and, and look at one of those reputable review sites, Consumer Reports, PC World, PC Magazine, CNET, something like that. Okay, the okay. second question I had is, um, would you not recommend that someone had on their computer that the passwords are saved, so if you go to a site, your computer automatically puts that password in? You mean like, a, like Chrome or whatever saves the passwords yeah, and auto fills them in? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. So here's the deal with that, that is certainly better than having ABC123. If you know your computer is, sec and, and, and security people, top level security people will tell you they don't like that. But if, if that's the option of not, of not having strong passwords and being able to have strong passwords because it remembers it for you, as long as you know your computer is secure, you know, like you make sure that you have the laptop, the laptop locked every time, you know, you, and if you go, whatever, and your home computer is secure and it's password protected, et cetera, I'm okay with that. I think the password, I'm moving now because I have so many passwords, I'm moving now from that to the password manager because I want to have it with me everywhere I travel and I don't want to have to go through all this nonsense that I'm going through all the time. So that's, that's where I am. I, and I actually interviewed um, the woman who is uh, the director of the cyber labs. She's top-notch security professional at, MI, at uh, Carnegie Mellon. I interviewed her for the last story I did. And I said, what are you doing? She says, I finally decided to go with a password manager because I have too many passwords. Life is a risk-reward benefit. And yeah, something might happen, but the risk-reward of not having secure passwords, and I'm willing to go with it. So she actually finally said to me, I'm going with that. And that's when I decided it was time for me to go that direction as well. Okay, okay good question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for that. One more. I'm full from the wings. Or one more. Okay. Thank you for the recommendation on, on password managers. Uh, not enough people are doing that. I wanted to ask if you have tried hardware-based authentication at all. It's especially useful for locking up your password manager because if someone gets access to that, they can right. get your passwords. So have, have you personally started using uh, YubiKey or Google's Titan or one of those? And uh, if, if you have any experience, what's your experience? And then lastly, do you think that the hardware-based authentication methods are likely to become more prevalent in future years? So your first question, I have not personally used it yet because I have no, I, I mean, nobody's in my home but me and at work, uh, they haven't asked us to do it yet. Um, but I've seen it like at hospitals where when my doctor gets on now every single time, uh, the nurse, they got to do the little to prove it's really them and boy, it locks up I think in like 15 seconds. So that's, that's good. That's really, really good. The second question was? Uh, do you think that, that hardware-based authentication will become more prevalent? And I ask that because I work in cybersecurity, and I'm, I'm trying to get people to use that right. more. It's what has to happen is, and I said this at the very beginning, the mindset in this country has to change. We've got to be willing to put security ahead of speed and convenience. That's where they are in Europe. They put security comes first, and then convenience and speed are a little down the road because they know the problem if something happens. And you know, I remember when smart cards came out. It will slow down the line by 1.5 seconds per transaction. You know what? It's a lot longer than 1.5 seconds when I got to call every single person in my credit card that is automatically billed to me every month and tell them, please, here's the new credit card number. We've got to realize that, that these things, that we ha and we have to have layers because the bad guys are able to, they keep getting smarter and smarter all the time. And 
you have to do layers to slow them down, and that's we're going to have to get to that sooner or later. We're going to have to put security ahead of speed. I, I'm now doing my company now requires when I, I was writing a story today for Como, and it now requires a second uh, factor authentication. So when I was trying to go on my website to file my story for Como on the website, it said. Hold on, give, uh, where do you want the code to come? Your cell phone or your home phone? And I got a code and I had to put it in. Yeah, it was a pain. But you know what? That's really good. It's keeping somebody from getting on and changing our web copy or doing something or doing something on our computer system we don't want. We've got to have that mindset. Yeah, that was really good. I'm really glad that uh, TSA patted me down because I know there's no weapons getting on the plane. We really have to get to that mindset. So thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for uh, hanging out. You're all going to get an extra 2% interest on this month's balance. Uh, that's what they tell me. Okay. Thank you, Herb. Uh, one more time. Uh, a lot of information shared here tonight. Um, I don't know if you took copious notes, but I'll make one more plug for Herb's website, uh, consumerman.com. All that information's out there. I urge you to go check that out. Um, the other, since this is the last thing we're doing tonight, um, I'll give you uh, a homework as a gift. Um, please check out our BECU.org website as well. Um, on there, there's a section called security. You'll see the link. Um, we also have uh, offered uh, tips and tricks and some of the same things that you've heard tonight, plus some things that we've added in specific to uh, your membership at, at BECU. So again, thank you all for coming. Have a very pleasant evening. and. Um, Good night.